Warning, I say a lot of bad words. If you're under 13, you probably shouldn't be watching this. This game is goddamn amazing. Buy 20 copies this instant, or Jesus will hate you for the rest of eternity. That's it. That's the review. You can all go home now. Please excuse me, but it's a bit difficult finding a place to begin talking about this one. Prey 2017's very place in existence is quite bizarre when you look at its history. Not only is it built as a spiritual successor to Looking Glass Studio System Shock games, much like how Bioshock did the same thing, but it's also sort of a reboot to a 2006 cult classic FPS with the same name. The original Prey was developed by Human Head Studios, who would also later go on to make The Quiet Man, a game that resides within my nightmares quietly. A sequel to it was in development hell for a while before it ultimately got cancelled, and in its place was a game that had literally nothing to do with the 2006 game other than you're in first person and you shoot shit. The 2017 game was published by Bethesda and developed by Arcane Studios, the same team behind the Dishonored series. While Prey 2017 released to really good reviews, it sadly underperformed sales-wise. I mean, it's not all that surprising given that Bethesda did a terrible job advertising the damn thing, so most people didn't know the game was… this until it came out, and games of its type have hardly ever done that well financially. But it's still a shame this game didn't do so well because it's really, really good and definitely worth playing. I remember in early 2018 using some extra Christmas money to pick this game up on a whim, and when it finally escaped my endless hellscape of a backlog, I was super into it for the next month. Arcane Studios makes some damn good stuff, and I really love how much attention they put on complex game mechanics and player choice, with Prey being my favorite of their titles as of now. And yeah, their upcoming game Deathloop looks pretty damn sweet, and I'm really looking forward to it. But in the meantime, I wanted to do a video covering Prey because I really love this game, and I want as many people as possible to experience what's easily one of the best games I've played in recent memory. We begin with our main character, Dr. Morgan Yu, whom you can either choose to make a man or a woman, asleep in their apartment before being woken up by their brother Alex. They work together for an organization called Transtar, and Morgan gets called in to fly from their apartment via helicopter to run some tests. Personally, I don't care what job we're talking about here, if I have to travel by helicopter to get to it, I'm putting in my two weeks, I really don't like heights. A title sequence later with the fantastic synthwave to go along with it, Morgan arrives at Transtar to run a few tests and answer a questionnaire before being sent to a space station called Talos-1. However, the scientists get attacked by this mysterious black creature that disguises itself as a coffee mug, and then Morgan gets sedated, later waking up in their apartment again in what appears to be a repeat of the previous day. Okay, so this is either some Groundhog Day shit, or Morgan was actually living in some very elaborate simulation. It's the latter. As it turns out, Morgan, Alex, and everyone else are already aboard Talos-1, and an alien species called the Typhon have escaped containment, severely damaging much of the station and killing almost everyone on board with only you, Alex, and a select group of survivors left. A bit of backstory reveals that Prey takes place in an alternate history timeline. Most notably, the attempt on President John F. Kennedy's life failed, because nothing bad ever happens to the Kennedys and the US and Soviet Union doubled down on and accelerate the space race, building a space station to contain and study the Typhon after its discovery. Federal funding toward the facility ceases after an incident happens on the station where several researchers died, but it's later acquired by a stupidly wealthy private corporation, the aforementioned Transtar, and research then resumes. Gotta say, at least when rich assholes in this universe make space-related financial investments, at the very least it's for something cool instead of lame bullshit like Jeff Bezos sending a giant penis into orbit. An AI called January guides Morgan to her office, where along the way she comes across a device called a Neuromod, which I'll explain in a bit, and then plays a video Morgan recorded via Looking Glass technology, a not-so-subtle reference to the very studio that made the game's arcane takes inspiration from. It's revealed Morgan was testing Neuromod technology, which gives a person enhanced skills via altering the way their brain is structured, at the cost of removal causing permanent memory loss of anything from the point of installation onward. While it's mostly just there to give a plot reason for why the skill upgrade thing is a thing, the way Neuromods work is both fascinating and also terrifying with how many implications come from the whole permanent memory loss aspect. The game explores this idea a pretty good amount throughout its narrative, and I really appreciate that it does so. 
There's so many ideas this concept could be used for, it's hard to list off specific examples. But yeah, Pre-Amnesia Morgan set up the Operator AI in the video recording as a contingency plan for Post-Amnesia Morgan to follow through on. Before you learn more though, the video is cut short by Alex who wants to explain the situation to you in person. Totally not sus. After reactivating and playing the rest of the video, it's revealed that Morgan set all of this up to have the station destroyed in order for the Typhon threat to be wiped out before reaching Earth and dooming the planet. Basically saying everything and everyone, including you, must go. But then there's another operator AI called December who suggests there's another way to get off the station without destroying everything. Both AIs have Morgan's voice and they seem set up by Pre-Amnesia Morgan for entirely opposite purposes, so something strange is immediately going on. But of course, your memory is fucked to hell, so you basically just have to roll with whatever the AI tells you to do and figure it all out from that point forward. Morgan's amnesia is the narrative detail used to put you in the character's shoes, and it's a pretty effective way to convey plot and world building to Morgan and the player, given how little of, well, anything either of the two actually knows going in. This paves the way for one of the more defining aspects of Prey from a narrative standpoint. That being the choices you have to make. Prey has one of the more nuanced takes on morality-based decisions I've seen presented in a game. It's less about choosing the obviously good option versus the cartoonishly evil option, and more based around how empathetic you feel toward the person or situation at hand. One of the earlier decisions you make in the game is deciding the fate of a prisoner in Psychotronics. He's got quite a list of serious charges against him, which he claims are mostly bullshit, and he's completely at your mercy to choose whether he deserves to die for his alleged crimes, or if you'll be merciful and give him a second chance, knowing he could be a potential danger to anyone still alive. The game also gives you the option early on to just abandon the station and essentially leave the Typhon threat and main conflict unresolved. Though that's only a couple examples without spoiling everything this game has to offer, but anything and everything you do for the characters in this game revolves around one very complicated moral dilemma. Is it worth trying to help or provide a sense of hope for all the people, even though for most of the game the main goal is to destroy the station and take everyone and everything with you? Would the more merciful option actually be to just kill them on sight instead of instilling them a false sense of hope before you just take them all out in a fiery explosion? Do you try finding an alternate solution where as many survive as possible with the very real risk of Earth being destroyed by the Typhon? I just wanted to shoot aliens and explore a cool sci-fi space station. Why do I feel so morally conflicted about virtual people? that don't even exist. Diagnosing, bruising, operations, fatigue. Nothing I'll have you feeling better soon. Good as new. Please fill out a patient experience questionnaire so I can serve you better next time. Oh hey, the medical operator is played by SpongeBob. That's pretty neat. But yeah, there are a lot of variables that determine the way Prey's narrative plays out, many of which seem pretty nonsensical when you look back, evaluate, and weigh some decisions you made against others. Late near the end of the game, you're given the option of readying an escape shuttle to evacuate everyone off the station, but is there a point in doing so after you're given the option of neutralizing the Typhon without taking out the station? And doesn't evacuating everyone kinda defeat the whole point of destroying the station? None of this is suggesting writing flaws or anything, it's just further questions to ask yourself as the main character when considering the ideal way to handle this very bad, horrifying situation. Much of the first half of this game, you feel isolated and alone, pretty much having nobody to help you deal with the mess in person, and relying almost entirely on transcribed communications to help you get out alive. And when you do finally meet up with a group of friendly survivors, it does feel genuinely relieving to see some friendly faces around this increasingly unfriendly environment. Even if it does raise quite a few questions about how some of these guys are suddenly now able to make their way around Talos 1 unscathed, when they were backed into a corner and barely holding out when Morgan found them all, and the Typhon threat is only continuing to escalate more and more as the story progresses. Ordinarily, I wouldn't notice something like that, but given how meticulous most of Prey's world building and narrative is up to this point, details like that really stick out. As interesting as the storytelling is in Prey, it's definitely got its weak points and one of them is the final act of the game. At a certain point, a brand new antagonist just randomly gets dropped onto the player who's also trying to wipe out everyone on Talos 1. He's voiced by Steve Bloom, who's doing a very crappy Russian accent. Your brother, he likes a microphone. A spotlight. He can't resist. Even though he's hiding. And you are running around like a nervous rat. I hear you. Chewing the wires and shitting in the walls. Are you trying to fix the mess you've made? Or just get away? I pride myself in being prepared for the worst. 
But this, this is truly a masterpiece. You should be proud. I don't necessarily hate this aspect of the story, as it does bring in a few interesting moments and decisions, but it comes way too late in the story to get the proper screen time it needs to feel at all meaningful. It feels like it's trying to be this game's version of the Would You Kindly reveal from Bioshock, but they kinda drop the ball trying to do that, and as a result, this final bit of conflict feels more like an excuse to artificially lengthen Prey's runtime, when it didn't really need it. Oh, and uh, by the way, spoilers for the ending of Prey are coming up right now, so I'll put in a timestamp for you to skip to. In addition to the final act of the game, one of the things frequently criticized about Prey is the ending. After you choose to either destroy Talos 1 or neutralize the Typhon threat, along with anything else you did leading up to the ending, it's revealed that the entire game was a simulation. We were actually controlling a human-Typhon hybrid the entire time, just placed into the perspective of Morgan Yu by Alex. It turns out that Earth was fucked by the Typhon the entire time, and the whole game was essentially an empathy test, with the final cutscene having you be evaluated by Alex and the operators, who posed as important characters throughout the simulation. Your choices, the amount of Typhon and humans you killed, and the neuromods you equipped are all taken into account when determining whether you can help serve as a metaphorical bridge between humanity who can feel empathy, and the Typhon who completely lack empathy. The final choice is choosing to either shake Alex's hand, making the experiment a success, or killing and destroying everybody in the room. Now, on the one hand, I do understand some criticisms people may have with it. In-game, it does feel kinda sudden, and at face value, it can feel like it largely invalidates pretty much everything you did. On the other hand, I fucking loved it. Now, don't get me wrong, they could have very easily fucked up the whole it was all a simulation ending, but I think it was done really well here. For one, it puts the more seemingly trivial and unimportant aspects of Prey's narrative a lot more into perspective. A lot of what you do seems to deliberately be there for the sole purpose of testing player empathy because... It is. Both Arcane and the in-game characters deliberately made it like this. The ending is very meta when you look at it like that, and it does make me a bit more forgiving of the less good aspects of the story. It's not even a case of none of this happened and it doesn't matter, because the game explicitly confirms the simulation is based on events that did happen in-universe. It probably thinks it was dreaming, and nothing mattered. You're right. What you experienced was a reconstruction based on Morgan's memories. Say what you will, but in my opinion, the ending was really good, and if you disagree with me, I will call you a bunch of bad names. Also, I felt my mind explode when I realized that the game opens with the player taking a behavior test, and then it turns out at the end, the game itself was a behavior test. One of the answers on the questionnaire is push the fat man. Alex Yu is a fat man that you can push around at the end of the game. That's actually super clever, and I'm not even being sarcastic here. The story does falter in a few areas for sure, but the parts that Prey gets right more than make up for its shortcomings. Prey falls into a very niche category of game dubbed the Immersive Sim, essentially a fancy descriptor used for games, mostly first person, that put heavy emphasis on mechanical depth, environmental interactivity, and player choice. Even if you haven't heard this genre specifically spoken by name, you're probably familiar with at least a few games of this type. Looking Glass Studios' works such as Ultima Underworld, System Shock, and Thief the Dark Project, Arcane's previous work Dishonored, as well as Bioshock and Deus Ex. One of the defining aspects of immersive sims is that games of this type are typically a hybrid of several other genres, with Prey being a fusion of first-person shooter, western RPG, stealth, and metroidvania mechanics, with a bit of survival horror also thrown in. The opening sets the stage for what to expect from the rest of Prey, presenting an environment that's contained but painstakingly detailed with even the elaborate simulation Morgan was trapped in being fully operable the moment they escape from it, allowing Morgan the chance to see the strings of the metaphorical puppet show firsthand before pressing on. You're then presented with the first variation of Typhon, the Mimics. These black gooey creatures that kinda sorta look like a fusion of the Venom symbiote from Spider-Man and the facehuggers from Alien. Their whole thing is camouflaging as whatever smallish objects are in the vicinity, and killing any humans in a horrifying manner that makes their body look like it's frozen in time. You begin with your sole weapon being the wrench, which works fine enough when dealing with whatever mimics you come across, but you're gonna need more than that with all the things that come up later. Prey has a pretty wide arsenal of weapons to choose from, but very cleverly, the first new weapon the game gives you is actually one of the non-lethal ones. That being the glue cannon. 
a multi-purpose weapon that shoots this white adhesive that freezes enemies in place, fixes or absorbs some environmental hazards, and creates solid platforms on just about any surface that allow you another method of accessing normally out-of-reach areas. This shit is like flex tape, I swear to god. The many uses the glue cannon has throughout the game, despite it not being at all deadly, makes this one of the more unique weapons I've seen in a game of this type. With Prey having already conveyed its emphasis on multiple pathways and methods of progress, the glue cannon is such a perfect tool for this, and you're gonna want to keep this thing on you at all times, it's an absolute necessity in Prey. And yeah, there are other weapons here too, traditional stuff like a pistol and shotgun for strictly offense, in addition to a lot of the more unique weapons like the particle beam, EMP gun and grenades, and the recycler charge, just to list a few. Also, there's the Huntress Bolt Caster, which at first seems like a joke weapon, but it's really useful for distracting enemies, and on my recent playthrough, I learned that you can use the darts on this thing to unlock doors and press computer screens. We have truly reached peak game design. Ammo for everything is both limited and scarce, meaning that you'd be wise to make the most out of all you've got and not be a wasteful little bastard. There's plenty you can find lying around everywhere, or you can just craft some with the appropriate materials on hand, but conserving ammo is a pretty big must for getting through this game, due in large part to the various Typhon throughout the station. While the enemy variety isn't super big, and Typhon are rarely if ever together in large groups, these guys can be quite brutal, and the game is really smart about what's placed where to make both you and the enemies take advantage of the current surroundings. All I'm saying is that you shouldn't be too surprised if a single phantom can beat your ass into the ground, especially around the beginning before you get decently equipped with stuff. Even on their own, these guys can do some pretty serious damage. You're better off early on finding some turrets or explosives to deal with these guys, if you choose to take them on. There's also the previously mentioned Mimics, who, again, aren't super hard to defeat, but them disguising themselves as just about any movable object creates an environment where you really need to be constantly wary, or risk getting caught off guard by these little bastards jump-scaring you. Normally, I hate jump scares for how lazy and cheap a tactic they are in place of horror with actual thought, but Prey does them really well, and I secretly kind of smile inside when the mimic successfully spooked me. I think it helps that they aren't scripted events, but unpredictable behavior based on how the specific enemy class operates. And those are only two examples of what's overall a small, but uniquely threatening roster of enemies. Others include the poltergeists that turn invisible and throw random objects at you from across the room like the cowardly little turds they are, technopaths that turn all technology against you, cystoids that attack anything in motion and blow up upon contact, while also poisoning you with radiation, which is very rude. Oh, and the nightmare. <laughs> Okay, looks like I'm gonna need to spend the whole night doing something because I sure as hell ain't getting sleep now. In general, I find the Typhon to be a really interesting threat, as they seem to constantly evolve and learn as you go through the story, gradually sending Talos 1 into further disarray until Morgan can finally put a stop to them in one way or another. Thankfully, Morgan also has a very useful upgrade system in the form of the aforementioned Neuromods. In gameplay, installing one or more Neuromods will let Morgan unlock new upgrades in several different skill trees. These include things like increased health and armor, greater proficiency in combat, and increased efficiency with computer hacking, leverage, and repairing broken machinery. But then there's the Typhon upgrades, which basically turns Morgan into Kirby, allowing them to copy whatever abilities the Typhon have and use them to their advantage, at the risk of station security turning on Morgan if they have too many Typhon mods installed. It all paves the way for even more freedom and experimentation with how you choose to play this game, and with Neuromods being numerous but still limited, you kinda need to decide what your priorities are for how you want to take on the many threats aboard Talos 1. One of the challenges with this style of game is finding the perfect balance between making the areas you constantly visit and explore simultaneously effective as video game levels, while also making them feel like a place that could theoretically exist and be lived in or operated in, and Prey hits a pretty good sweet spot with this. It's all interconnected, albeit separated by loading screens, and you'll be revisiting most of these areas a lot. Though they are kept interesting with having something new to offer each time you revisit an area, so this thankfully isn't an issue for the most part. The sheer abundance of detail put into every square inch of Talos 1 is absolutely bonkers. Every room, hallway, entrance, exit, and sector of the station feel like they're connected in a manner that would make sense for the sake of normal operation before, well, you know, everything went to hell. There's the main lobby, workstations, research labs, crew quarters, maintenance areas, and I could go on. Every sector feels like it served an important role for the Talos 1 crew, whether it be the research the station was designed for, or just leisurely activities when workers are off the clock. 
there's an entire side story basically involving a bunch of, likely now deceased, crew members putting together a D&D campaign. You frequently go outside of the station into space, and out there you really get a full perspective of just how big Talos 1 really is. In addition to the main narrative, there's a possibly even greater amount of environmental storytelling that more than sells that Talos 1 was once a normal, functioning work environment before it was plunged into the chaotic state it's currently in. Just based on the placement of environmental details, you get the exact picture of what went down in so many areas on the station without the game even needing to tell you. One of the more well-known parts of this game is when you enter a specific room where a bunch of sticky notes that each say, not a mimic, are placed on just about anything in the room that's, well, not a mimic. This is one of those games where you'll want to pick up literally anything and everything you can, because chances are it's useful and you're going to need it at some point. Med packs, repair kits, food, ammo, even just random useless junk is important. See, Prey has a bit of its own crafting system where you use a recycler machine to break down objects into basic materials, those being organic, synthetic, mineral, and exotic. Then you place the materials into a fabricator to essentially 3D print anything you have the blueprint and appropriate materials for. I know crafting systems aren't really anything new anymore, especially in our current modern times. The Prey system is really effective, and it'll certainly be helpful for supplying extra ammo and healing items. Just make sure that you're smart about it, especially because it's also used for important quest items. I almost locked myself out of one of the endings because my idiot self didn't have enough materials to craft the Null Wave device, and I was just barely able to scrape together everything I needed to craft it. So yeah, uh, don't be a dipshit with it, okay? Similar to Arcane's Dishonored, the missions in Prey all have several different ways they can play out depending on how you choose to take things. It's even possible to permanently fail some of these objectives if the quest giver dies, or you run out of time to get everything done. You really need to play this game more than once to truly get the full picture of how many different possibilities and variables there are. I found the game overall to be reasonably challenging, but usually not annoying, at least on normal difficulty, but there are moments that did get on my nerves, mostly around the end. When the final act begins, the whole station becomes infested with these annoying operator enemies that are all over the damn place, and they're not very fun to deal with. The Operators were another enemy class throughout the game, this isn't jarring or anything, it's just tedious dealing with so many of these things in abundance. Their placement throughout the environment feels a lot more random and less deliberate than the Typhons are. Honestly, this along with the sudden new conflict makes the final hours of Prey feel kinda rushed and thrown together with how lackluster and unpolished it is compared to the rest of the game. I will say, the final, final stretch of this game is pretty sweet though. Artificial gravity on certain parts of the station goes completely out, so you're left using your propulsion system to fly around during your mad dash to stop the Typhon. Using this thing to explore the station's exterior was one of my personal highlights from this game, and having its final use in the game be for this mission was really nice. The game definitely ends on a really high note, I'll more than give it that. While Prey isn't gonna push new boundaries in terms of graphical fidelity or whatever the fuck, and NPC facial animations are very not good at all, it's still a visually stunning game with a really interesting presentation that more than makes it aesthetically stand on its own. The general look of Talos 1 gives off a bit of a what people decades ago thought the future would actually look like kind of vibe. It's a beautifully lit setting with all the natural and artificial light sources being utilized in a way where everything important is highlighted and you can still see perfectly fine, but you're always on edge and nervous about what lies ahead. Prey isn't officially classified as a horror game, but its atmosphere feels pretty appropriate for one, and this is only perpetuated by the sound design and soundtrack. This game is very thick in atmosphere, with ambient background noise and enemy audio used to great effect. One specific specific detail I love is hearing the voices of deceased crew members come out of the phantoms. It's super creepy and adds another layer of mystery as to if these things are more sentient than first thought, or if the crew members are still partially alive but trapped in these horrid creatures. I can't go without mentioning the soundtrack, especially given that it was composed by none other than Mick Gordon, whom you probably know most of all for doing the music in Doom 2016 and Eternal. Prey's soundtrack is significantly different from Doom's, being more subdued and atmosphere-oriented, but Mick Gordon absolutely nailed this and further made Prey that much more immersive of an... immersive sim. This genre needs a new name, the current one's kinda dumb. I mean, just listen to the theme for the title sequence.
particular track is called Everything is Going to Be Okay. Cap. With that said, this is probably a good place to start wrapping everything up. In spite of a weak final stretch in my opinion, Prey is an absolute joy to play, and I'd very much recommend it. Well, maybe not if you hate needles given the first Neuromod installation, but still. Honestly, I could probably go on further about why this game is so good, but I'd rather you all see it for yourself, and I'd also rather not edit two hours worth of video together. The game's disappointing sales numbers don't really surprise me that much, given that immersive sims are a pretty niche genre, even if Bethesda were to somehow market the damn game correctly. But I have a gut feeling Prey 2017 is going to gather a pretty strong and dedicated cult following later down, if it hasn't already. But yeah, as far as the AAA industry goes, this is very much one of the hidden gems of the past few years, and assuming this type of game is your thing, I'd highly recommend it. Anyways, thank you for sitting all the way through to the end. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. I'd very much appreciate the support. Next time, I'm gonna go over why I really, really love one of the more divisive games in the Legend of Zelda series, so keep an eye on that. Take care and thanks for watching, I'm out. <laughs>